Welcome back to ECE 320A. It was quiet until I pushed record and then everybody, the volume just really went up. We've had our first exam, so I thought I'd let you know when exam number two is. It's on March 21st. There's a spring break somewhere between that, but before exam number two, you have three homework assignments, and those are actually already posted or available to you on mastering if you now want to go in and look at the problems that have been assigned to guide your learning that's available to you you may not want to answer all of them just yet but you now have the ability to go in and look at the problems in homework three four and five that will be the content or the topics for exam number two Today what I want to do is remind ourselves where we left off before the first exam and that was starting or we would had just started Laplace transforms. We'll then look at deriving some differential equations for a circuit. You'll have to do that with the homework in certain problems. We'll find an integral differential equation and you use this every day. You probably don't text it because it's a little bit long in terms of a word, but an integral differential equation, it contains integrals and derivatives. We'll derive that for a circuit. That's required in your homework. And we'll then say, well, if we have this integral, can we Laplace transform it? We'll look at how to, what a Laplace transform of an integration in the time domain looks like, and it's really the reciprocal of what a derivative looks like. We've learned that multiplication in the frequency domain is the same as differentiation in the time domain as an operation. Integration in the time domain is like division by S in the frequency domain, and that's what you'll start to become comfortable with as we work with Laplace transforms not just of signals or waveforms but as operations or operators. This complex frequency variable S is now an operator. We'll derive some pairs. When I say pairs of Laplace transforms I'm meaning what does it look like in the time domain and what's its pair in the frequency domain and we'll just have columns of these Laplace transform pairs. You need to become comfortable manipulating a transform expression into a collection of these individual entries in your table and then being able to go back and forth between this Laplace transform table and saying, oh, here's what that looks like in the time domain. We'll derive some pairs for the impulse, for the exponential, and then we'll look at complex exponentials which allow us now to use or find the Laplace transform of sinusoids. And everybody knows Euler. Euler's our friend. That's how we can express sines and cosines as complex exponentials. And it's easier to integrate exponentials than sines and cosines if you remember your calculus. Then we'll Laplace transform a rectangular pulse. We'll look at different theorems associated with Laplace transforms and we might the book might call those operational transforms what happens if we advance or delay a signal in time what does that correspond to in the frequency domain what if we do something similar in the frequency domain we shift the complex frequency variable s we say s plus a instead of s well that might look like exponential decay in the time domain or multiplying a sine or cosine by e to the minus alpha t for example and we'll look at this operational transform of scaling first let's quickly go through the the commercial part or the advertisement part of today's class which is the review we're reviewing now the Laplace transform. Here's the definition. It's simply this integral of the waveform in question, f of t, and we're scaling that or weighting that by this complex exponential, e to the minus st. s is a complex number. 
And you can think of this complex number as a complex plane. S can be anywhere on that complex plane. But now you're scaling this f of t over all frequency and, and in here over time as well. And you're integrating all time out and you end up with a transform expression in the complex variable s. We've done that already for a unit step. And here are different ways of thinking about a unit step. The time domain description, it's one as long as the argument of u of t is non-negative and it's zero otherwise. It's Laplace transform is one over s. And we'll start plotting one over s or expressions like some ratio of polynomials in a complex plane where the real axis, or I'm sorry, the horizontal axis is the real component of S. The vertical direction is the imaginary component of S. If you plotted one over S in the complex plane, all the values of S that cause your denominator to vanish, we will call poles and we'll indicate those with X's. Any finite value of s in the numerator that causes the numerator to vanish or to equal zero will give those the name of a zero and will indicate those on the complex plane as open circles. You can see here 1 over s doesn't have any finite zero. There's no finite value of s that causes the numerator to vanish. Somebody might say well we have an infinite zero. And yes, you do. If you let S go to infinity, capital F or capital U of S would vanish. So that would be an infinite zero. We'll deal mostly with finite zeros and finite poles. We do, though, have a pole when S is actually equal to zero. And so that pole is at the origin. That's a special place in the complex plane. And that's now what you could see relative to the unit step in the time domain and the frequency domain. You need to be comfortable going back and forth between the kitchen and the living room. Remember? And you need to be just as comfortable in one room as the other. And if somebody's talking to you about the frequency domain, you need to be able to smoothly glide over into the time domain and have an idea what they're or what that might look like in the time domain. That's the skill set you want to possess as an electrical and computer engineer or a student of ECE 320A. We then looked at the Laplace transform of a derivative. And the differentiation is an operation. It's not a waveform. And now we go into the frequency domain and say, what's that operation look like in the frequency domain? And we found that the derivative operation in the time domain, in the frequency domain, that looks like a multiplication by s. This s is very useful. It can be used to describe a waveform. It can be used to help us with operations, operations being differentiation and integration. But here's what we derived for the Laplace transform of a derivative. And in the clouds down below, everybody's now comfortable with things in the cloud. So I thought I'd put these, this information in the cloud. We have one cloud on the left and one cloud on the right. But they're connected. One's in the kitchen, one's in the living room, right? So if you wanted to draw some pots and pans and then maybe some sofa or around those clouds so that you're comfortable, but now you have derivative operation in the time domain is consistent with or correlates with multiplication by s in the frequency domain. And that's what we've learned by this derivation of the Laplace transform of a derivative. Now you might want to wake up. Here's a homework problem, in fact. Hint, hint. It's problem 1231. Somewhere on one of your homework assignments, homework 3, 4, or 5, you will be asked 
to work problem 1231 and I'm actually kind of working it for you. So there's a benefit in coming to class, maybe. Here's the circuit, maybe. Yeah, I had to qualify that, didn't I? <clears throat> Here's the circuit, and I've labeled it with all different kinds of colors, just so that we can sort of distinguish between different pieces. We have nodes identified with green A and B. We have a mesh identified with a green M. Those are, some, those are associated with Kirchhoff. So Kirchhoff and green, that just goes together, right? Everything's green now too, right? Green engineering, Kirchhoff's green. <laughs> green t-shirt. All right. Red and blue is for wildcat. But red is important because those are the variables we really want to key in on if we're writing differential equations for electrical circuits. What we have is basically an unenergized circuit and then at t equals zero we kick in a i sub g of t, some generic waveform, some current source and we apply that to this three element device and if you were writing equations associated with this RLC circuit what would you expect? How many equations would you think you would need to describe this system dynamically? Or if you're writing differential equations for this circuit, what's the order of, the, of that differential equation or order of differential equations? Do you have four coupled second order differential equations for this problem? What? How do we find the order of a differential equation? The energy storage elements or devices and what is storing energy in this circuit? Capacitor and inductor, two. So we would expect a second order differential equation or maybe two first order differential equations that are coupled. As I said, this is the commercial part, so I'm just going to scroll through this. And we've already covered this, I think, and before the exam. I'm sure you don't remember it since it's on the other side of an exam, but we did talk about this. Two energy, distor energy storage devices, inductor and capacitor, so we could get a second order differential equation or two first order differential equations that are coupled. Let's see if we can come up with such equations and we're always going to rely on these two buddies, Eli and Ice. Those you need to remember until you graduate. Graduate? No, until you retire. Where am I? Woo! Yeah, you have your shin guards on today? Yeah. So Eli and Ice the inductor and capacitor. V is equal to LDI dt and I is equal to C dV dt. That guides our writing of these differential equations. And I've tried to emphasize the variables of interest in red. Inductor currents, capacitor voltages. That's what we might focus on if we're writing differential equations for these circuits. Let's look at one solution and actually this isn't the solution you may want to s use to work the problem in the book. The second solution will be what the book wants. But here is, I'll say, my preference. Let's write two KCL equations at nodes A and B. And if we go back there are nodes A and B. KCL just says the algebraic sum of the currents in and out of those nodes needs to sum to zero or currents in equal currents out. Relative to A, node A, we have I sub G coming in from the left 
we have I sub L going out, and we have I sub R or I sub C, that's the same, going out as well. KCL at node A is just I sub G is equal to I sub L plus I sub C. KCL at B looks trivial. I sub R in equals I sub C out. But that's useful information. What? Looks like the same, doesn't it? It is the same. But it's equal, and that's all we're saying. But we will use Eli and Ice to help us put some dynamic behavior behind that. Those are KCL at A and B. Let's now follow through with that. Here's KCL at A. I said I sub G is I sub L plus I sub C. From ICE, we know I sub C can be rewritten as a first order derivative. The capacitor times the time rate of change of the voltage across that capacitor. And that now gives us, just substituting I sub C, that expression for I sub C from ICE, into IG equals I sub L plus I sub C, gives us one first order differential equation. That tells us the time rate of change behavior of that capacitor voltage in terms of the inductor current and the applied current. There's one differential equation. We would expect to see a second. And we have a second equation which is coming from KCL at B. And KCL at B we said was this trivial relationship I sub R is equal to I sub C. Again, we can say, oh, but I sub C is C dV sub C dt. But we don't want to write this in terms of a third variable, I sub R. We really want to express this in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages. Can we now rewrite this I sub R in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages? What if we go back to our circuit? Can you now find a relationship for I sub R? That would be the voltage at A minus the voltage of B divided by R. The voltage at A is V1. Eli, right? V is equal to L di dt. We now have this voltage in terms of inductor current. Minus voltage at B, which is just V sub C, capacitor voltage, divided by R. That's what, that, there we go. We have it. We simply rewrite I sub R in terms of these voltages and that resistor, and we have our second first order differential equation. You'll have these notes so you don't have to rapidly be copying these down and this is the commercial anyway, right? Ugh, it's a long commercial. Somebody's already gone for drinks and food, and snacks. Well, they're gonna miss the good stuff if they stay away on that commercial break for much longer. Here's I sub R. <clears throat> we have L D I sub L D T minus V sub C over R. We now set that equal to C dV sub C dT, but we have another way of writing C dV sub C dT from the previous equation in terms of I sub G and I sub L, and that's cleaner. Now we have one derivative and capacitor voltage, inductor current, and applied current relationship. And I've tried to highlight that in yellow, and if we rewrite that, we now have this second first order differential equation. And it's coupled with the first one because in both equations we have capacitor voltage, inductor current. One of them gave us a relationship on the time rate of change of the inductor current. The first one gave us the time rate of change of, in, of the capacitor voltage. And we can now solve that set of coupled first order differential equations
however we want using our differential equations that we learned in previous classes. We will learn that we can use algebra to solve these differential equations by Laplace transforming them. That's why everybody likes Laplace transforms as we've now replaced all this differential equation stuff with algebra stuff and knowledge of these transform pairs. That's what we want to be learning now in this class. Here's solution number two, what the textbook wants. That's a movie, isn't it? What the textbook wants. Oh, uh, you must go to a different theater than I do, but I, th I think this was the marquee movie at some theater that I was wanting to attend. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway. What the textbook wants. They want you to write equations in terms of V sub 1 and V sub 2. Those two node voltages. V sub 1 and V sub 2 in our circuit. And I had labeled those in the previous circuit in blue. V sub 1 and V sub 2. V sub 1 is the inductor voltage. V sub 2 is the capacitor voltage. Can we now write equations, differential equations, in terms of V sub 1 and V sub 2? We'll do that as our second way of solving this. Whatever you do, solution 1 or solution 2, they should be equivalent. But if the textbook wants it this way, where am I? Then let's write it this way. And the first is consistent with the last solution, KCL at A. IG is equal to I sub L plus I sub C. We have a first order differential equation, but we want it in terms of V1 and V2, not I sub L. We can use Eli, though, to get rid of I sub L. We simply need to invert, essentially, this derivative and we now s integrate both sides and we now have a way to isolate or describe the inductor current in terms of its voltage. The voltage across that inductor is now 1 over L, I'm sorry, the current through that inductor is now 1 over L, the integral of the voltage across it. If we use that expression back in the earlier in the first line or the second line to replace I sub L, we end up with that long word that you were just wanting to text to everyone tonight. Integral differential equation. That's what this is. We have an integral and we have a derivative. We have an integral differential equation. Type that six times fast maybe before Thursday's lecture. It's kind of a long text. Might run against, it might not even go into the cloud. Never mind. All right, There's, that's just one equation though. To get our next equation, we can write KVL around that mesh M1, which was the right mesh which is just minus V1 plus VR plus V sub 2, and we can replace V sub R, since that's not what we want. We want to write V sub R in terms of V1 and V2. Well, we can write that by realizing that the voltage dropped across that resistor is just R times the current through it, and the current through it's the current through the capacitor, which is ice, C dV sub C dT and V sub C is V sub 2, now we have a second differential equation written in terms of V1 and V2. Those two equations you will want to utilize in one of your problems. But hopefully, if I remove this from the screen, you could reproduce that. Yeah, I'll just wait until he posts the notes. That's our piece. Anyway, all right. 
in one of those equations, we had not only derivatives, but we had an integral. We've already learned how to Laplace transform a derivative. We haven't looked at Laplace transforming an integral, so let's look at that. And then we would be able to Laplace transform both of those and use our algebra to solve for whatever variable we want. Let's now look at the Laplace transform of an integral and if now the commercial is over. Now we're going to become writing everything down. How did we perform what calculus manipulations did we use when we were Laplace transforming the derivative? What strategy did we use? Integration by parts. And that worked so well for us, let's try that here. This is the Laplace transform of an integral, which means that the waveform that we're Laplace transforming is this integral from 0 to t of f of tau d tau. And to do it by parts, let's call that v and that dw. So that now we have v of t is equal to this integral of 0 to t f of tau d tau and dw is e to the minus st dt. If we take the first differential of that integral, what's going to pop out? If it was dv dt, it would just be the argument of that integral. But we're now saying just dv, this is now f of t dt. And if we integrate dw, I think we did that when we were doing the parts before, we now have this minus 1 over s e to the minus st. And now we can, instead of writing at the integral of v dw, we have this equal to v w minus the integral of w dv. So let's write that down. This is now going to equal the integral from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau, that's the v, and the w is minus 1 over s e to the minus st. Again, just substituting or using integration by parts, here's the first piece, and we evaluate that at the upper and lower limits of integration, and then we subtract from that the integral of w, which is minus 1 over s e to the minus st dv, which is f of t dt. And these integral limits are from 0 minus to infinity. So now let's put in the appropriate upper and lower limits into the first piece. We have minus 1 over s e to the, so this is now 1 over s e to the minus s infinity integral from 0 minus to infinity of f of tau d tau. And that was a minus there. Then we subtract that, so we have a minus a minus, or we have a plus, 1 over s, e to the minus s, 0 minus, integral from 0 minus to 0 minus, minus 
f of tau d tau Boy, running into the side of the chalkboard's difficult. And if you're not watching, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> what? So what's there I'm evaluating at the lower limit. And what do I get when I integrate from 0 minus to 0 minus? 0. Yay! I wanted it to disappear, and it is. But that's evaluating uv at the lower limit. This was evaluating right here uv, that product, at the upper limit. And what happens with e to the minus s infinity? That goes away as well. That's vanishing, meaning we can now say that this is going to 0. This, if we integrate over nothing, we get nothing. So those two terms, that uv evaluated at upper and lower, goes away. Then we're left with plus the last piece, which was this 1 over s, which is independent of t, integral from 0 minus to infinity. And I'm just going to switch the order a little bit, put this in front of the complex exponential, and this should look very familiar. That's just the definition of the Laplace transform of the waveform f of t. This is now f, capital F of s. All of that, we have 0 plus 0 plus 1 over s f of s, what we were trying to show is that the integration operation in the time domain is consistent with division by s in the frequency domain. Therefore, the Laplace of the integral from 0 minus to infinity of f of tau d tau is just 1 over s times f of s. We've now derived or found the Laplace transform of the unit step, Laplace transform of a derivative operation, Laplace transform of an integration operation. Let's now look at some other common waveforms, Laplace transforms. Let's Laplace transform an impulse. And before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of some of the properties of an impulse waveform. Recall that if we were integrating from minus infinity to infinity of this impulse, which is what I'm indicating there as delta of t, f of t, dt, this is what I'm defining to be the impulse function. What does that equal? Did everybody hear that? This essentially sifts out what the waveform in the integrand is, f, at the instant when the impulse is active or when the impulse operates. And when does this impulse occur? That impulse occurs when its argument is 0, and here the argument is t. When t is 0, then the only thing that we're going to see coming out of the integral of f of t dt for all time is the value of f at t equals 0, when that impulse happened. 
that's what happens when you have an impulse waveform inside the integrand of an integration operation. Whatever it's weighting, we simply see the value of that waveform's expression when that impulse occurred. Suppose we did something else. Suppose I now said, let's look at the next integral. Let's say we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity, delta of t minus t sub zero, f of t dt. And now I say, what's that equal? So what is this integral going to equal? If we use the logic we used above, we said, well, it's going to be f of something. What's that something? That something is it's going to evaluate f when that impulse occurs. And when does that impulse occur? That impulse is happening. Where was that? Did anybody catch that? If t naught was 5, it happened at 5. It happened when this argument was equal to 0, or when t minus t naught equals 0, or t is equal to t naught. At t equal to t naught is when this impulse happens. That means that on the right hand side we will have f where? Fill in the blank. It happened where that impulse happened and where did I say the impulse happened? At t naught. These are facts that we have to now be comfortable with. If we're comfortable with the way that the impulse function sifts waveforms outside the integral, then we can easily find the Laplace transform of an impulse. Meaning, the Laplace transform of an impulse, we can write down simply this way, and that's now this integral from t equals 0 minus to infinity of delta of t. We put the waveform itself and we weight it with what? The complex exponential e to the minus st dt. And what comes out? When's this impulse active? When its argument is zero, and in this case, that's when t is equal to zero, we're including everything at zero since we're integrating from the leftmost edge of zero, which is t equal to zero minus. So we're capturing this impulse in the integration. Now this is our f of t from above. We need to evaluate that where? at zero, so now we have e to the minus s, zero. e to the zero. If somebody wants the Laplace transform of an impulse, it's one. Really. And we can call that the sifting property. Do we have any bakers here? Anybody sift flour? Or is it always pre-sifted? Do you get the bag that's always pre-sifted? Does anybody know what a sifter looks like? Build up your hand strength sifting flour. Uh, son, I've got 50 pounds of flour. Do you want to sift it? <laughs> so that's how you can build up your grip, sifting 50 pounds of flour. Anyway, 
that that's now what did we just do the Laplace transform of an impulse what if we now wanted to look at some other waveforms Suppose we look at the Laplace transform of an exponential. We need to understand this one very well. Let's just keep it generic and say we want the Laplace transform of E to the gamma T. And we're not specifying what gamma is, that's just some variable. T is our time variable. If this is the case, then we simply plug that waveform in to the slot reserved for that waveform in our Laplace transform definition, which is this integral from t equals zero minus to infinity, e to the gamma t. We weight it with the complex exponential and we integrate over all time. And now you're thankful that you remembered your calculus. Now you remember how to integrate exponentials. We now say, well, let's just combine. We can form a single exponential by simply algebraically combining their exponents. We now have this is equal to the integral from zero minus to infinity of e to the minus s minus gamma t dt. S and gamma are not functions of t, so we can just treat those as a constant and we can integrate this with respect to time. Or this now becomes 1 over minus S minus gamma e to the minus S minus gamma t evaluated at the upper and lower limit. What happens at the upper limit? e to the minus infinity. That goes away, so let's neglect it, right? e to the minus infinity is zero. Then we subtract this, which has a minus sign, or we now have minus e to the minus s minus gamma zero minus. All of that stuff in the right hand term or right hand side is e to the minus something times zero. e to the minus zero. e to the zero. What's e to the zero? One. All of that then boils down to we have a minus a minus that goes away and we're now left with one over s minus gamma. That's the Laplace transform of an exponential. Stop me when you're fin, but I'm trying to emphasize that this is very important. or I could say a very powerful result. Why? Because we didn't specify what gamma was. It was some variable or constant. And we could make that gamma real. We could actually make it complex. And that's where the power comes. And it's so powerful that I just went ahead and created a table. 
This is our next commercial, isn't it? I'm trying to market this product. This is the Laplace transform of an exponential where that exponential can be real. It could be negative in the top and it ends up being one over S plus sigma. Meaning if you now had E to the minus two T and you wanted to Laplace transform that, what would you end up with? If sigma now is two, plug in a two where sigma is in that top row and you have one over S plus two. The Laplace transform of e to the minus 2t is 1 over s plus 2. That's pretty straightforward. If it happened to be where that sigma, and what does e to the minus 2t look like in the time domain? e to the minus 2t. Doesn't that look like an exponential decay? Doesn't that look exponential to you? Come on, say yes before I have to do this three or four more times. I'm going to pull something, right? <laughs> yeah. What did he pull? <laughs> I don't know. That's not going to ever go away, is it? <clears throat> now, let's look at the second row. Was that a question? Yeah. So you didn't know what it looked like? <laughs> no. Where do we get the S from? S is a complex quantity. It's a complex number. And what we're doing is we've simply defined, wow, I'm glad it came back here. That was very convenient. I, I think it's listening to what we're saying in class. But we just defined the Laplace transform as this integration step. That integration involves this complex frequency variable s. In this expression, we're looking at f of t scaled by a complex exponential. We're integrating over all time from zero to infinity. We're looking at this waveform in its entire history of time and we say, oh, what does that actually look like in terms of its frequency content? And that's going to be contained in the transform expression that results, capital F of S, after performing this integration. And so the frequency content of this waveform becomes in the frequency domain represented by capital F of S. That being said, now we just derived this when little f of t was an exponential. We said, what if f of t is e to the minus 2t? Oh, we derive that and it ends up having a frequency domain representation of 1 over s plus 2. Its frequency content now is contained in 1 over s plus 2. What it looks like in the living room is 1 over s plus 2. What it looks like in the kitchen is e to the minus 2t. What it looks like in the time domain is this exponential. What it looks like in the frequency domain is a ratio of polynomials in s where the numerator is constant and the denominator is s plus 2. So if you plug in frequency variables for that s, you can see how that waveform functions or operates at that particular frequency. This will all start to make a little bit more sense as we learn more. But we're going to have fun, meaning we will... Wasn't that? Well, it's fun, so let's laugh, yes. So we have this frequency expression, f of s, to find its frequency response we're actually going to walk up the imaginary axis and we're going to evaluate that expression as we walk up the imaginary axis. And that will tell us how that waveform behaves at each frequency. We'll go to J1 and we'll say, oh, how does that waveform, what's its frequency behavior at omega equal to one radian per second? And we could say, oh, what's its distance from us and what's its angle? We just 
we'll start collecting all of this as we go. And I think maybe next time I'll give you a sales pitch for the Laplace transform. What can we accomplish with the Laplace transform? But now that's where the S comes from. The question was, where did this S come from, I think? Well, it came from the definition of the Laplace transform. And what you need to be comfortable with now is viewing S as a complex number. And you can just lay it down on a plane. That could be on your, where was the frequency domain? The living room or the kitchen? Uh, let's put it let's put it in the kitchen let's do the frequency domain in the kitchen so the s plane is on our kitchen table to our right in the horizontal direction is the real part of s vertical direction is the imaginary part s is this complex plane and what if we're interested in a particular frequency we go to that frequency and we say okay what does everything look like from this point of view we go to a different frequency well, the frequencies that we will concentrate on are probably the imaginary axis. And we'll walk up that imaginary axis. That's when S is equal to J omega. And we'll say, okay, look at omega equal to 1. Look at omega equal to 2. Look at omega equal to 3. And we can go all the way to infinity. And we can get the frequency content of that waveform as a function of frequency. This all sounds kind of weird right now, but it'll start to make sense, especially before the final exam. Or it better make sense. Does that help with where did S come from? You'll never ask another question in all semester, will you, after that description. But here are some ways of examining the Laplace transform of an exponential when we allow that exponential to be real or a complex exponential. And in the far right column, I'm showing you the pole pattern associated with the particular Laplace transform or frequency domain description of that time domain's waveform. When we had a decaying exponential, e to the minus sigma t, we ended up with a pole on the real line in the left half plane. The S plane will have a right half plane and a left half plane, all determined by the imaginary axis or distinguished by the imaginary axis. The decaying exponential has a pole in the left half plane we'll learn that the left half plane is the nice place for stable or exponentially decaying waveforms. If we had a growing exponential, e to the sigma t, where does that pole live? It lives in the positive half plane on the real line at sigma. If this was now e to the 6t, e to the 6t looks like what as a function of time? e to the 6t, I can't even hardly illustrate that because it goes quick, it goes high fast, doesn't it? It blows up exponentially and that's very fast. It now has a pole over here in the right half plane at plus 6. And poles in the right half plane correspond to waveforms that are going unbounded in the time domain. Or systems, if it's describing a system that has an unstable pole and that one blows up on you. It, you smell it, it starts burning up. Different ways of it going unstable. Yes? Yes, so here in the top row, I'm sure this is confusing, but here I'm wanting sigma to be a positive number, so minus sigma will be negative. Sigma, let's say, is 2, and minus sigma is minus 2. Now I have e to the minus 2t. What does that look like? That's this decaying exponential. 
minus sigma is where I am in the S plane. That's now a pole at minus two. And I have a transform expression, one over S plus two. And if you wanted to evaluate this, you would say, where's my pole? Well, it's when the denominator vanishes. When the denominator is equal to zero. You set S plus sigma equal to zero. Solve for S. S is equal to minus sigma. If this was S plus two, you now solve for S plus two equal to zero and you have S equal to minus two and that's where you would draw your pole at S equal to minus two. What if we allowed that gamma to be imaginary? It didn't matter what gamma was, it would just be one over S minus gamma. Here gamma is J omega. This is now e to the j omega t. Do we all know what e to the j omega t looks like? Complex exponential. Hmm. How do I visualize something that's complex? Very carefully, huh? What is this? e to the j omega t. I just like to think of it as a spinning, a rotating spinner. And it's spinning at a rate of omega. What's the magnitude of e to the j omega t? One, isn't it? Because of Euler. Euler's our bud. So this has a magnitude of one. And what's its angle? Omega t. So as t increases, this just keeps rotating has a magnitude of one, so this is like something on a unit circle that's just spinning, and it's spinning at a rate of omega. Another way of thinking of this is e to the j omega t, oh, that's like sines and cosines at a frequency of omega. It's a combination of sines and cosines at a frequency of omega. So don't get too hung up on, what is this, complex exponential. The other thing is we will be playing with polynomials that have real coefficients. If our coefficients are real, then we will have these complex numbers appearing in conjugate pairs. If we have something at plus j omega, we're going to have its twin at minus j omega. That's what I mean by appearing in conjugate pairs. We would have an e to the j omega t together with an e to the minus j omega t. So one's going this way, the other one's going this way, and they're going together. That was terrible, but they're going at the same rate. Oh. And that feels kind of good, actually, if you do it right. Yeah, we need to. Good thing this isn't being recorded. There's a cell phone somewhere. But anyway. Everybody comfortable with this table? I hope. What can we do with this table? Put it in your notes, right? But this is very powerful because now we can find Laplace transforms of sines and cosines. So let's do a little background before we go there. What did I say? Who was our friend? Euler. Euler. And what do we know about Euler? We know e to the jx is cosine of x. What else? Plus j sine of x. I like that so much, I'm going to give it a blue star. If that's the case, what if I replaced or looked at e to the minus jx? That's the same as e to the j minus x, which now up above I can just replace x everywhere with minus x. If you're comfortable with Euler, we can apply Euler again and we have cosine minus x plus j sine minus x. That though can be cleaned up 
by remembering that cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. Cosine of minus x is the same as cosine of x. Sine of minus x is minus sine of x. Or we can now say that e to the minus jx is equal to cosine of x minus j sine x. And if I starred the last one, I have to star this one, and I have to distinguish them. So one's a one star, and the other one's a two star. Now we have Euler represented by its conjugate. And now we can find where sines and cosines come from. We can look at adding star and double star. What if we take star and add it to double star? What's on the left? e to the jx plus e to the minus jx. What's on the right? Now I'm adding those star and double star. I have a plus j sine x and a minus j sine x. Those go away. I add a cosine x to a cosine x. I get two cosine x. And now if you ever see this, you say, oh, cosine of x is e to the jx plus e to the minus jx over 2. Boom. If we want to play with cosine x, we can also play with complex exponentials. Now, do you see what those rows in that table were used for? The bottom two? Sines and cosines. If we... That was what we had when we added those two. If we compare them or subtract, you can see that we have e to the jx minus e to the minus jx. And what happens when we subtract the bottom one from the top one? What happens to the cosines? They cancel. And now we're subtracting a negative. We get two of the sine pieces. And they include a j. So that now sine of x is equal to e to the jx minus e to the minus jx over 2j. So that now, if we want to find the Laplace transform of a sine or the Laplace transform of a cosine, we're done. Because we just had our table telling us we have the Laplace transform of e to the jx. We have the Laplace transform rho of e to the minus jx. Let's just combine them algebraically and they'll give us cosine of x, Laplace transform. That's the end of the background. Now we can move on to what we wanted. Laplace transform of sinusoids. Or we now have that the Laplace transform of cosine omega t from Euler is now the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t divided by 2 and what's upstairs? What was the cosine? That was the plus, wasn't it? Plus e to the minus j omega t. And the Laplace transform is a linear operation. We can split this into two pieces. And one is scaled with one half, as is the other one. We have one half the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t plus one half Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t. We go back to the table. 
and we find what the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t was. That's this 1 over s minus j omega. Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t, that's 1 over s plus j omega. We put those in where they belong down here, and we have 1 half over, what did this look like? e to the j omega t had a Laplace transform of 1 over s minus j omega plus 1 half over s plus j omega. And now you wondered why your fourth grade algebra teacher was always on you with algebra. Now you need to use your algebra to simplify this. Let's put it over a common denominator. The common denominator is now the product of s minus j omega with s plus j omega. And now we have 1 half s plus j omega plus 1 half s minus j omega. What happens when we FOIL with the denominator? First, or outer, inner, last. The product of those two quadratics, or two terms, I should say. Give us S squared, the inner and outer cancel, because we have a minus J omega S and a plus J omega S, and we have a minus J squared, j is the square root of minus 1, so we have a plus omega squared. Downstairs simplifies to s squared plus omega squared. And the top, we have 1 half s plus 1 half s, or s, and the imaginary components vanish, don't they? They cancel. There's the Laplace transform of the cosine. What's the Laplace transform of the sine? Do you see how you would do it? You would now simply use the same manipulation with e to the jx minus e to the minus jx. Now you have a 2j to keep track of. And you should end up with something that looks as follows. So now if you looked at the Laplace transform, so here the Laplace transform of the cosine omega t is equal to s over s squared plus omega squared. And what does its pole zero pattern look like? What values of s cause the denominator to vanish? The poles are when s squared plus omega squared is equal to zero. Yes? This now says that s squared is equal to minus omega squared. What if we take the square root of the right-hand side? We have the square root of minus 1, and we call that j, don't we? And we take the square root of omega squared. That's omega, and we're taking the square root, so it's plus and minus. So we have s is equal to plus and minus j omega. There's where our poles are. The poles are at s equal to plus or minus j omega, which if we sketched those, here's j omega, and its twin or cousin equidistance below the real axis at minus j omega is its pair, its conjugate pair. Do we have any zeros in this transform
representation or frequency domain or Laplace transform of the cosine. Do any finite values of s cause the numerator to vanish? Zero. Yeah. Right at zero. So now we get to draw a zero and that zero is right there. That's now the pole zero pattern of a cosine with a frequency what? Omega. Now do you really want to have some fun and go to the circus? You like clowns? I like circus tents. So think of a circus tent. <laughs> and what do you have with a tent, circus tent? You have poles that hold up the canopy, right? And you have stakes that keep it on the ground. Now view these X's as infinitely long poles. That's a long pole. And this zero is a thumbtack. Now stretch a rubber canopy over those two infinitely long poles and that thumbtack. And position yourself at the origin. What's origin? S equals zero. But what's a frequency of zero? DC. So now we're at DC right here at the origin. That's frequency zero or DC. Where do we want the imaginary axis to be? Right here. So now we're, we're at DC and we're walking up the imaginary axis. The frequency response, the magnitude, is really the height of our circus tent above us. So at zero, we have no magnitude at DC for this cosine. But as we walk closer and closer to this pole, what happens? That height gets really, really big, doesn't it? The height of the circus tent is supported by this infinite pole. What happens? Well, if you kicked this system, it naturally wants to shake at that frequency where that pole is. So if you initialized this system, if it corresponded to this cosine, it would naturally want to shake at what? Omega. Did you notice that? That was omega. I can't dance either, but I can go to the circus. <laughs> now you have a a concept of frequency response, right? It's a circus tent. And its poles are determined by where the poles are on the S-plane. And what the magnitude of that frequency response is, what it looks like, is determined by the height of that circus tent above you as you walk around or walk up the imaginary axis. What happens, oh, so the zero, let me just finish that, is when s is equal to zero or at s equal to zero. What happens when we Laplace transform the sine? What do you think the denominator looks like? It actually looks exactly the same as the cosine if we're at the same frequency omega. The denominator, and do this at home. I know you just can't wait to get home and derive this. So I'm going to release you in a little bit. Oh, it's tough to keep you back in the classroom now. <laughs> right? Because I know you want to run out and re-derive the sign. But the denominator is s squared plus omega squared. Where are the poles? Where were the poles above? Plus and minus j omega. Have they changed? The denominator is the same. 
we have exactly the same poles. What about the zeros? Well, you haven't derived it yet. Let me give you the answer in the back of the book. It's omega. Is there, what's, where's the zero here? Do we have any finite zeros for the sign? No, but the numerator definitely depends on the frequency, doesn't it? That didn't appear in the cosine, but we had a zero in the cosine. We'll pick up there with exponentially damped sines and cosines, all sorts of fun things with respect to Laplace transforms.